Next topic, uh, which is the adjunct, is the use of calibration spheres. Uh, as shown on the right, on the left, you can see digital assessment for an upstream stricture. If you can't pass um, your, your fingertip or a calibration sphere or a Foley, then that's a clinically relevant stricture that should be addressed at Can you guys still hear me, hopefully? Yes, um, this yes. is, okay, great. So uh, these are some spheres that I came across on Amazon. They're actually called coin ring making foraging balls. I think they're made for using rings. And I'm fond of using the 1.9 centimeter um, sphere. And I just found on Amazon today, you can actually get um, three quarter inch steel ball bearings, uh, which is basically that third one there. And that's the one we typically use. Um, if you think about the adult colonoscope, the tip is about 1.3 centimeters, so two centimeters um, that should be able to easily pass. Dr. Hall is fond of using a Foley catheter, and she does inflate it with 10 cc's of uh, saline. And you can see, you know, you insert the sphere uh, and then run it up the bowel, and when it gets stuck, then you do a, a, a stricturotomy. And that's shown very nicely in this video, which has been published uh, in Diseases of the Colon Rectum. Uh, recently, and this is sped up just for the sake of time. And um, you can see that we're going to first insert the uh, the sphere into this case, the cut end where we're doing a, an anastomosis. And this is actually a former whole patient. That's actually a, a prior Heineke Mikulich stricture plasty site. And then you know we open it up and then run the bowel up. Now you got to really be gentle. Um, you don't force it. If you force it, you're going to get a tear and the patient's going to get a leak. You have to use very gentle pressure when pushing these spheres up. And this is just demonstrating uh, taking a biopsy and you can see it's pretty um, inflamed and bleeding. And then this is just a, a demonstration of the putting the clips on the mesenteric margin for uh, localization uh, postoperatively. Uh, next technique that we're going to briefly review is the uh, Finney strictureplasty. Um, thankfully, these are pretty rare uh, for these moderately long segments or strictures, and the, the contraindications are the same as discussed for the Heineke Miklowitz. But the, the caveat here with the Finney is that it's an antiperistaltic reservoir in a patient with diseased bowel, right? So um, a lot of people, you know, think that the Finney, similar to a staple side-to-side -side anastomosis, can cause an antiperistaltic reservoir, which can lead to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and be a source of chronic pain in a patient who's already prone to have chronic pain. And we'll come back to that concept a little bit later. The overall concept of this stricture is open longitudinally and then closed side-to-side, -side, um, as shown uh, in this illustration. And this is what the final product looks like. And again, I think some of you may have seen this video. Um, I posted the teaser of this um, on the uh, on Twitter. And again, here's just the overall concept um, of the hand sewn side to side antiperistaltic uh, pouch, if you will. And here you can see we're just opening up the entire length of the bowel, and then uh, we're going to fold it side to side. And then we're doing a hand-sewn enteroenterostomy there. You can see uh, we're just completing uh, the interrupted uh, back wall. And I try to get those um, tails to point down as opposed to pointing into the anastomosis as unfortunately shown here in this video. And then um, after uh, we get the nice back wall and you can see how thick the bowel and disease the bowel is. But this patient already had, you know, foreshortened bowel. So these are the kind of patients that we're going to be using it in. The um, running um, back wall uh, is pretty long, and you often have to use more than one suture and then tie the tails to itself. Here we're uh, doing a patency assessment, and you can see that kind of leading edge is going to get kind of folded in as you get to the front of it. And then finally, um, as with the Heineken Miklowitz, we can do a dilute betadine uh, testing. And here's the completed. You can see there's a Heineken Miklowitz at the outflow. It's really important to make sure that you have adequate inflow and outflow, kind of like a vascular surgery approach when doing finnies. Uh, finally, in terms of strictureplasties, uh, this is uh, the um, isoperistaltic side to side um, strictureplasty. Um, popularized by uh, Fabrizio Miglasi, um, a good friend and acquaintance of mine. Thankfully, these are, are quite rare and they're for the very long segments as we discussed. 
the uh, contraindications are the same for the other two types of stricture plasties. And uh, importantly, this is not for the faint of heart and you really have to be an expert in sewing. And this is why, you know, we, we all the fellows who train with me get their, you know, lots of sewing experience. A, it's fun. It really doesn't take as long as you might think. And in cases like this, it's really critical that you're an expert at sewing. Um, the, the overall concept is that you have two adjacent segments of um, structured bowel, which are uh, open longitudinally and then overlapped and hand sewn in an isoperistaltic manner. Importantly, you do have to incise the mesentery so that the, the proximal half of the segment will then um, be advanced and overlap with the distal half of the segment. So basically, you split it in half, split the mesentery a little bit so that the proximal segment will slide over the distal segment. And it's uh, shown here uh, in a little bit more detail in terms of illustrations. Now, this is not, uh, not my best video, but um, it's, uh, it's the best we have demonstrated the Michalassi approach. Unfortunately, we started the video a little bit late, but here you can see that the mesentery needs to be incised. And here we've already kind of um, overlapped the bowel. And here you can see we've sutured the back wall together. Now it's starting to look a bit more um, like something we can recognize. And, and then it's very similar to the Finney, we're transitioning to the front wall. And again, you can see how diseased the bowel is. This patient only had 200 centimeters of small bowel going into this operation. And this is a really long segment. And then finally, before we finish uh, tying the front wall, uh, we can beta dine test it. And then here you see how long of a suture line, again, this similar to the Finney looks kind of like a pouch, if you will. The alternative to, you know, all of these is resecting. And, uh, you know, occasionally we do a Heineken Michelowitz or several Heineken Michelowitz or a Finney or a Michelassi, and we just are not happy with the way it turns out technically for whatever reason. You know, the alternative is you're going to resect it anyway. So, um, uh, you know, that's just more reason to uh, try to do these trichoplasties if possible. Um, due to the risk of recurrence, when we do resect small bowel, uh, a lot of us favor doing a hand-sewn end-to-end um, enteroenterostomy because the, the main advantage of, is that it uses less bowel than stapling. Um, basically, you know, it's just your anastomosis in two ends as opposed to a side-to-side -side where you're potentially going to sacrifice, you know, eight centimeters on each side, depending on what size stapler you use. Um, the technique is we use a 3-0 slowly absorbable suture is what I prefer. Uh, we interrupt the back wall, which is the outer layer, running continuous inner layer, and then interrupted lumberted uh, front outer layer, front wall or outer layer. And, and in general, it takes about 30 minutes um, in um, experienced hands. You know, and th this is a case of a patient who uh, we had done previous uh, stricture plasties on and had had a previous jejunostomy, but was not compliant uh, with medications. And uh, we, we just had to resect this segment. And this is what it looks like, these tandem strictures where you really don't have uh, enough length between the strictures necessarily to uh, do a Heineken Mikulitz uh, stricture plasty. Very briefly, um, I'm going to show uh, how we do a hand-sewn end-end iliocolic with a cheetle slit, which is a, I do the small bowel anastomosis uh, in an identical uh, manner. And we've gone over the technical aspects of it in terms of how you actually do it. And the cheetle slit is kind of important. That's worth spending an extra second on. And due to the mismatch in the... Um, in the size of the um, dilated proximal small bowel and the, the normal size distal small bowel or the larger colon and the smaller ilium, we'll often do a cheetle slit, which is we use cautery to make a uh, anti-mesenteric full thickness, roughly about one centimeter, but tailored to the size of discrepancy. And this is very similar to the spatulation that's used in vascular surgery and urology, but it's only typically done on the one side, which is the smaller side. And um, here you can see we're um, resecting uh, an ilicolic resection. And here we have the ilium on the right and the colon on the left. And here's the cheetle slit demonstrated. That just makes the lumen that you get at nastimos uh, wider. And then here's the back wall, completed back wall. And then the running continuous uh, inner layer coming around to the front. And then that's finished. And then we'll typically add an outer layer to Lambert and invert the suture line. 
So in this patient um, that was published by Angus Lee, one of our former, former fellows, uh, this patient had a total of 26 strictures. And this is the before picture that we showed earlier. And here's the after. We dated a total of 11 Heineken Miklowitz, uh, one Finney and one hand sewn a small bower section. And you can see all the different suture lines there. This particular page you'll note has a G-tube. We placed an intraoperative peg because we actually, we did a um, duodeno a jejunal, jejunal bypass in this particular patient as well, which is another advanced technique. So moving on, that, that's like the first half of the talk that really focuses on the stricture plasties, but there's a lot more that we can talk about in terms of valve reserving surgery for Crohn's. What we really want to know is, can surgery decrease the post-operative recurrence rate, especially in this era of biologics? Um, and thus, we have to talk about the role of the mesentery. So we're going to move on and, and refocus our context to discuss ileocolic resections. And this is a great paper that I alluded to before uh, by Dr. David Binion um, and Miguel Ruggiero and several others at UPMC a couple years ago. And although it's not a randomized trial, it gives you real food for thought in terms of how we approach Crohn's disease. The majority of Crohn's ileocolic anastomosis worldwide, about 70% are done in a staple side-to-side -side manner, um, and uh, less commonly about 10 to 20% are hand-sewn end-to-end. But what they looked at here was long-term functional status, quality of life, and healthcare resource utilization after these two different types of anastomoses. And what they found was that the patients who had hand-sewn end-to-ends had fewer emergency room visits, fewer hospitalizations, fewer CAT scans, and overall um, uh, actually should be a higher uh, quality of life. Um, and in terms of the short-term um, complications, there was no difference. And overall, the you know, retrospectively, this is a retrospective study, there did not appear to be any difference in terms of disease recurrence, uh, medications, endoscopic post-operative recurrence, or uh, redo surgery. So this, this is one of the papers that kind of really set me on the road uh, about seven years ago to you know, performing a majority of hand-sewn anastomoses. And actually, I haven't done a stable side-to-side -side for Crohn's disease in, in several years because of this paper. Now, another important uh, kind of caveat or something to think about is, you know, what does it look like endoscopically? Um, because here you can see on the left is a staple side to side and dead on, you can't actually see the ileum and that's where it's gonna recur. You actually have to retroflex. And, you know, this is analogous to cancer recurrence, right? Except for colon cancer, it's gonna, you know, occur on the colon side, but in Crohn's, it's gonna occur on the ileal side. So it's really important to be able to, to endoscopically intubate that. And you can see in the middle, the stapled enticide, which is a you know, favorite technique of ours at Cleveland Clinic, you can basically see it dead on. And likewise, in the hand sewn end to end, you can also see the ileum kind of dead on. Something to think about. Now, you know, this is a case of recurrence. Uh, and, you know, we talk about endoscopic post op recurrence. And, you know, what we really want to know and what we're going to talk about is you know, is preventing post op recurrence, you know, can you do that um, and thus, you know, preserve bowel in the future by preventing the disease from coming back in the first place. And here is, an, you know, an endoscopic uh, image of an endoscopic a balloon uh, dilation of such a recurrent uh, stricture. Now, we're going to spend a few minutes talking about the Kono West anastomosis and um, rest in peace, Dr. Toru Kono, who uh, passed away uh, from GI malignancy a few years ago. I was luck lucky enough to meet him at the Crohn's and Colitis Congress uh, a couple years ago. And the overall concept is uh, that uh, it is a hand sewn uh, side to side, although functionally end to end, and I would say more so than a stapled side to side is. And you can see an endoscopic uh, image in the middle where, again, um, well, and this is why I say it, it's more, you know, it, anatomically end-to-end -end appearance because um, of the way it's lined up, and we'll show that in a second. Now, th this slide was taken from a, a talk that was dedicated to ileocolics, and I was comparing it with the bullets on the right to the other techniques. 
Um, it's less common. We'll talk more about that. It is longer, but it's not hard if you're fast sideways sew sewing. Um, as shown, it's easy to intubate and it does use more ileum. The end to end or the stapled end to side basically use no ileum and the um, staple side to side and the cone OS do use um, roughly about eight centimeters or so of ileum. The colon is not as important in this case, and we don't typically advocate for cone OS enteroenterostomies. So here is some illustrations that um, Ben Click, one of the gastroenterologists, and I had put together a couple of years ago. The first concept is to construct the supporting column. So that's done by first uh, stapling the, the two ends of the bowel uh, transversely to the mesentery at a right angle so that then you can sew them together. And this is kind of the platform by which then you do the second step shown on the right upper uh, panel where um, you, you have the supporting columns and actually a back wall above the supporting columns uh, constructed. And then you make these long, uh, roughly five to seven centimeter um, enterotomies or colotomies to, and then sew it together as shown in the uh, bottom panel on the right. And again, it, it's anatomically, it's more of an end to end, although technically it's a side to side. The, um, one of the pearls um, from um, this is that, you know, the only level one um, evidence for surgical technique to decrease post-op recurrence is really the cone OS anastomosis. And that's uh, by the Supreme um, CD trial by um, Dr. Lugio and Spinelli, who are both uh, friends and acquaintances of mine. And they looked at almost 80 patients who were randomized to either a stable side to side or a cone OS. Uh, and we're talking about a conventional cone OS. We'll come back to that. And they found that the um, cone OS had a lower endoscopic post op recurrence at three months and also had less severe disease with a Rutgers I3 or greater being more common in the, in the stable side to side patients. And then um, you can see the differences at 12 and 24 months. Now, this is a relatively small randomized trial, uh, but the clinical post-op recurrence uh, was lower um, at, uh, 20, at two years. And then the surgical post-op recurrence, I think, again, this is a small study. Clinically, a difference between zero and 5% is that clinically relevant or not? That's that's a question, but um, they did look at a multivariate logistic regression and only the cone OS anastomosis uh, was associated with a reduced risk of uh, endoscopic recurrence uh, with a pretty good um, reduced uh, odds ratio. Now, and you know, it's important to, to talk for a second about that the whole concept of the cone OS is that the, the, the anastomosis is about one plus centimeters removed from the mesentery, and that's the whole concept, is that it's not the anatomy of how the bowel is put together, it's how the anastomosis is somewhat removed from its mesentery by the use of the supporting column to kind of get it up away from the mesentery a little bit. And so, you know, the other mesentery concept is um, what's been popularized by Calvin, Calvin Coffey, which is the that of extended mesenteric excision, and it's very much in vogue, although still unproven definitively, that the diseased mesentery that we see in the photograph on the left actually is a reservoir for inflammation. And if the theory is that if you resect this diseased mesentery, look at those giant lymph nodes. We see these all the time and we used to ignore them, but we know that they're you know, immunologically and inflammatory wise very active. And um, so the theory is that if you re resect that disease mesentery, that you actually may decrease the post-op of recurrence uh, for these patients. And you can see that in terms of its iliocolic resection, that includes a relatively high ligation of the iliocolic artery. Now, it's important not to be too aggressive uh, because you don't want to devascularize the proximal small bowel in the process. And this is just another photograph showing what a traditional iliocolic uh, mesenteric approach would be that's close to the you know, bowel wall as opposed to the one on the left. They're dramatically different. Um, now, we don't know yet. There's no randomized trial of this yet. There's several in process. But to date, the level three data presented by Calvin Coffey it does suggest that the um, extended mesenteric excision is associated with an order of magnitude lower uh, recurrence rate. And I will note that uh, we're very proud of Dr. Coffey um, because he a, is a former um, 
uh, colorectal, uh, Cleveland Clinic Colorectal Fellowship alumni, uh, but also he was on the front page of the Science Times for uh, discovering a new organ in the 21st century, meaning the mesentery and looking at the mesentery as a unified uh, contiguous organ from ligament and traits to the end of the mesorectum. Now, like mentioned, there's several studies looking at this uh, mesenteric uh, sparing versus uh, more uh, radical approach, including one by Dr. Leitner, uh, my friend and colleague, uh, the SPARE study, and that's in process, and that's a multi-center, multinational study. And we're gonna talk about some more studies uh, in a second. So here, here's one of the animations or um, il computer um, illustrations of the mesentery from, you know, including um, all of the mesentery, the small bowel and of the mesorectum as well. And so, you know, here we have these two approaches of the mesenteric resection uh, or the cone west where the mesentery is excluded. And so somehow, you know, when I, when I got, came to Cleveland Clinic that, you know, this mesenteric decision was really a hot topic and Tracy Hull and Scott Steele convinced me to start doing that. And then Scott convinced me to pick up the cone west for, these recurrent patients. And so I naturally just started um, combining these uh, approaches. They didn't realize that at the time that there was anything novel about them. And so this is a paper that came out um, now to almost two years ago, uh, what we call the mesenteric excision and exclusion, where you combine the um, mesenteric, uh, extended mesenteric excision with the conoest anastomosis. And this is a great video uh, for anyone who wants to learn how to do the uh, conoest, please take your time. I think it's about five or six minute video. Here you see the extended mesenteric excision using a ligature. And then um, here, the, one of the key components of this kind of modified uh, Kona West is that I close the mesenteric defect so that the supporting columns actually have some support to themselves. And then the important concept is that the final luminal diameter of the anastomosis is uh, as per Dr. Kono's description, is supposed to be seven centimeters. So those of you who work with me, you'll see that I don't know, always make the anerotomy or clotomy seven centimeters, but I kind of tailor it to the patient and try to get it at the final diameter of the anastomosis of about seven centimeters. And here we're working on the back wall and here finishing up the continuous running front wall. And then we, pay, we see it's really wide open. You could drive a truck through this thing and then a front wall, and there you can see the, um, the final product uh, endoscopically. Now, this is just a small case series. Um, to, we've already doubled the number of patients in this group, and to date have done about 120 uh, Kona West operations at Cleveland Clinic throughout the different campuses. Uh, these patients were not cherry-picked. They all had strictures. About two-thirds of them had fistulas. Almost all of them were on biologics. A third were redos. The majority of these were done laparoscopically, a minority were diverted, and you can see 175 minutes for adding these two novel mesenteric approaches really wasn't absurdly long, and the length of stay was great at four days, in the area of enhanced recovery, and we didn't really have any intra-abdominal septic complications. Um, to date, I think we've done uh, about 49 of these MEE approaches, and there has been one Akona West patient who leaked and has been put back together uh, to date. Uh, now, there's a huge amount of interest on this topic right now. The Crohn's and Clitus uh, Foundation of the UK and Dr. Uh, Steve, Professor Steve Brown uh, has the uh, Meerkat trial, which is probably you know, one of the best design trials I've ever seen because it looks at all the different variations. It's a forearm trial looking at extended mesenteric excision with staple side to side, staple side to side without extended mesenteric recision. Kona West with standard mesenteric excision, and then Kona West with extended mesenteric excision. So it has all four combinations. Probably take a couple of years for that to finish. There's also uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Asi has a um, multi-national, uh, multi-center study looking at the Kona West versus the stable side to side, um, apart from the mesenteric excision. And then uh, Nick Smith, a former trainee from here, um, is uh, working on... Um, a, an ANZ, uh, Australia, New Zealand uh, st study of the modified Kona West. And here's a picture of Nick uh, right before he went back to uh, New Zealand. And they mentioned that the uh, Kona West is really a plasty like anastomotic uh, configuration, which is uh, very interesting. And in this randomized trial, they're looking at the Kona West um, 
with or without, uh, I'm sorry, with uh, mesenteric incision compared to stable side to side with mesenteric incision. So between these different studies, we'll get some answers within the next five years. Now, this, this report also did a nice survey which looked at their extended resection and in, in Australia, New Zealand, actually 75% of surgeons already not doing a close intestinal resection. So that's one of the reasons that they can do this. And you can see a minority are doing Kona West. So very interesting. And I congratulate this group and all the others uh, by looking at these big studies. Now, this is a hot topic on Twitter. And we can see that um, interestingly, uh, on a post just from a couple of days ago, although only 20% are saying they have switched to Kona OS. If you look at the combined numbers, about 48%, because some say they, it depends, um, uh, they 48% are at least selectively doing Kona OS. And we recently had a uh, DCR journal club on this. Uh, and that uh, is uh, thanks to Susan Glandiuk, the editor in chief, as well as Vlad uh, Bolshinsky, who um, came up with this idea of having the DCR Journal Club and look for more of these to come out on YouTube. Now, this is the new part of the talk we're about to finish up. And, you know, so is there a role for bowel preserving surgery ulcerative ulcericlitis? And the answer is yes. Um, I couldn't help but put, put in something about twisted pouch syndrome in this talk. And this is a case from just a few days ago that you can see, unfortunately, during a robotic uh, pouch, the, the pouch was put down and not recognized to be twisted. And you can see what we all fear and try to avoid of the proximal lupus small intestine going underneath the pouch mesentery. Um, and here on the right, you can see um, Adam Trong, who I think is uh, viewing right now, did this case with me, we disconnected from the anus and then we're able to untwist it and then uh, put the pouch uh, back down in the normal manner. So I would say there definitely is a role for bowel preserving surgery, ulcerative colitis. And uh, what we wanna focus on, um, I'll show you in one second, but this is just some more innovative stuff that we're doing to try to diagnose twisted pouch syndrome. And that's 3D staple line segmentation uh, on from CAT scans where we basically strip away the bowel and leave just the staple lines. And you can see this one on the right in particular, it's completely spiraling like a loop-de-loop -loop at Cedar Point Amusement Park. And I thank Doug Nishan, my radiology GI IBD colleague for these. And uh, this is something we're actively pursuing. Now, you know, the take homes for you on this, I think this is my last slide. Um, in, in order to try to avoid, um, you know, pouch mechanical complications and preserve bowel is to think about, you know, are you a high pouch volume surgeon? We, we try to discourage the occasional pouch surgeon because, you know, this is a really highly nuanced and difficult procedure. And uh, we want to, um, you know, really optimize uh, the patient's uh, outcomes by doing as many of these as we can and not just one a year. We want to use meticulous technique. Uh, we want to do the tension reduction measures that um, is beyond the scope of this talk, such as incising uh, the mesentery and, and others. We want to do a trial descent of the pouch before we transect the rectum, because rarely you can accept a slightly longer rectal cuff so that you can um, actually make the anastomosis and not have to do the rare parking of the pouch. Uh, as we discussed, you want to make sure the mesentery is straight from the duodenum to the pelvis, and not just to the pelvis, but actually from the pelvis all the way to the anus. Um, so we don't want to allow the pouch to rotate during stapling is kind of shown here uh, by this uh, the video that you can see it, it wants to spiral with the traditional um, circular staplers as opposed to the powered staplers, which close uh, straight. Uh, we were fond of doing betadine tests of the pouch before we put it in the pelvis. Of course, we check the donuts. We do pouchoscopic air leak testing and try to transanally sew leaks if we, if we see them. Excuse me. And then uh, don't forget to uh, leave a pelvic drain. I know in an era of enhanced recovery, people want to not, they want to leave the drain out, but you can get a pelvic hematoma and then it's going to, it's going to find its way out through the pouch anal anastomosis. Um, and then finally, uh, we're very fond of using CRPs because we know that if you enter, if you find a leak early while they're still in a hospital and a diverted, you can pop an endosponge in there and the endosponge is associated with an over 90% pouch salvage rate. It's really a miracle. If you get a pouch leak, you can actually get that thing to heal up within about three weeks. It's really amazing. I just closed two patients uh, last week who both uh, were, um, had their leaks uh, cured with uh, endosponges. 
So we covered a lot. Um, I hope you've um, taken some points about why bowel preserving surgery is the sine qua non of IBD surgery, especially in diffuse degenerative ileal Crohn's disease. Surgery, uh, surgical treatment is based on the principle of using bowel preserving surgery techniques whenever possible to avoid the long term risk of short bowel syndrome and to maximize patients long term outcomes and quality of life for these patients. Thank you. And I think we have um, a couple minutes for uh, questions. And this talk is dedicated not just to my family, but to all my colleagues uh, who work with me in the operating room and on IBD uh, patients around the world uh, globally. Thank you so much. Thank you for such Thank a fantastic you. talk. I'm not sure I am echoing, but in any case, um, there's a whole slew of questions that we have over on the surge on side. So we'll start with some of those. Um, for assessing your strictures, earlier in your talk, you were talking about using a Foley. How many cc's of fluid do you usually use or do you just kind of distend the balloon until you feel um, some resistance? Can you just talk a little bit more about that technique? Yeah, sure. So um, before I started using the calibration spheres, and actually the, the spheres were actually an idea of Dr. Ian Lavery. He was in a uh, open air market in Spain and got a bake light ball. And uh, so he, he's the one who, who came up with that. And uh, I think that bake light ball is hanging around in, in the Cleveland Clinic somewhere. Uh, but before I started using the spheres, I used to use a Baker tube, which is an extremely long intestinal tube. Unfortunately, they're not making it anymore. Um, a lot of people use Foley catheters. Dr. Hull likes the Foley catheter, and she does inflate it to 10 cc's. Gotcha. And then in terms of those balls that you use, do you know what they're called on um, Amazon? Dr. Avery Walker was curious. Yes. Um, so the most recent iteration I found on Amazon is their three quarter inch steel bowl bearings. And you can get a pack of 10 for about five bucks. And uh, now that I found a reliable source on Amazon, I'm going to be, you know, having them sterilize it and disposing of them because they get kind of gross and patinaed from the beta nine. Um, in terms of when you're taking biopsies selectively, how many biopsies are you normally um, taking? And I would assume every stricture that you're stricture plasting, you're doing new biopsies of those strictures? Yeah, that's a really great question. So usually one or two, I mean, it depends on the bowel is so brittle. Sometimes you can grab it with the biopsy forceps. I'm sorry, with the forceps and it kind of just breaks off. So I try to cut a nice little chunk out. And the hardest part of that is that, like you mentioned, if you have like 10 or 20 strictures, the path, you're driving the pathologist crazy. So you have to kind of really good, do good record keeping and say stricture one, stricture two, stricture three, and you have to document, you know, are you talking distal to proximal or proximal to distal? And, um, you know, typically, you know, these are not something that the tissues are pretty small. I, I only send frozen, so I'm really suspicious. If I'm not really suspicious, just a really chronic stricture in, in a patient who's had Crohn's for 20 or 30 or 40 years, I think sending it for permanent is probably preferable. And if you have to take, take the patient back for a logical resection, so be it. Um, Dr. Mark Solomon's joined on our surgeon side and said that it was an amazing talk. He uh, mentioned that Dr. Orkin still references that study that you had at the beginning. Um, and then he had a question in terms of, you covered a little bit of this, but at what point do you really resect instead of doing structural plasty? Is it really only for patients with severe penetrating or fibrostenotic disease? Oh, it's a great question. Thank you, Mark, for those comments. So no, so I think it's relative. There's a couple of things that play into it. One is the amount of small bowel that the patient has. Another is the, their disease trajectory. For example, the patient I mentioned a couple of times um, who's, who had 700 centimeters of small bowel was in their sixth decade, and this was their first surgery. They're on a biologic. So, you know, in my mind, you know, I'm not going to take the risk of doing 10 plus stricture plasties um, when we're, we're moving, even with a 60 centimeter segment of resection, um, you know, that patient's going to have 630 centimeters of small bowel, which is more than most of us are born with. So I think you have to tailor it to the patient. Um, but I will say that most of us advocate that if it's their first, first um, you know, surgery, that we have a, a lower threshold to resect, meaning we're more likely to resect. And obviously, as they recur, 
those are the patients who are going to be using the um, stretchoplasty and bowel preserving techniques more liberally. Great. And then um, Dr. Avery Walker wanted to know kind of what number would you call your cutoff in terms of high pouch volume? That is a million dollar question. Um, you know, we started to look at this um, a couple of years ago in terms of uh, the number of um, Whipples. And like, that's how I think about this is that society has deemed that it's unacceptable to be a low volume Whipple surgeon. And um, Dr. Berkmeyer and others, and, and we were looking at this and, you know, it, it's, it's, a hard, it's a hard number to come up with. I think, you know, the, the straight answer is one or two a year is probably not enough because the issue with pouches is that you have to be facile with taking care of the complications also. And there's dozens of different types of complications that these patients can get. So I think, you know, you know, obviously I, I think six plus is a reasonable number. I think one or two is not a reasonable number. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then Dr. Sarah Barker wanted to know, or sorry, Baker wanted to know the endo sponge that you're placing in endoscopy. How often are you normally changing this? Is the equipment different than the usual black sponge versus white sponge? And then how are you assessing closure endoscopically and radiographically? Great. Um, so we, um, what we typically do, and there's some publications, I think Fez's group published it recently, and we have a, a PowerPoint put together that if anyone's interested, I'm happy to email it. Um, basically, we take a black sponge and a, um, a 12 or 14 French rigid urethral catheter, and uh, we do both endoscopy and a digital rectal exam, and we palpate the size of the defect, and then we, it's very much arts and crafts. We cut the black sponge to the size of the defect and then cut a hole in the middle of it to get that rigid urethral catheter and then suture it to the catheter. And then um, you cut the flange that goes onto the black sponge. Typically you cut that off and then insert it into the um, end of the urethral catheter and then hook it up to a normal uh, vac uh, machine. And then um, typically we're changing that actually in the operating room. Um, although um, some places you could probably do the endo suite, um, the, you know, it's relatively uncomfortable for the patients and you probably get a better, you know, exam and out, you know, a better operation if you do it in a lithotomy position in the operating room. So we're typically doing it twice a week. Uh, Wimmel Bellman's and the other um, Amsterdam group published that, you know, large series of these, and that's where I get that 90% success rate from. They have a very different uh, pouch algorithm. They are very fond of doing the modified two stages, and they also religiously check CRPs. And if the CRP goes up, you know, they religiously early, they do a, a leak test uh, radiographically and then take the patient back, divert them, and then pop in the endo sponge. Now in Europe also, they have the commercially available, actually the endo sponge product, but here in the States, we have to uh, make our homemade ones. But honestly, the, the homemade ones work great. And then, yeah, we typically do it twice a week. So on a, like, for example, a Tuesday and a Friday, these patients will often be discharged from the hospital and then go to a, um, if they're not from the area, live in an extended stay type apartment situation for two to three weeks. And usually by three weeks, it's healed up enough that um, you can let them go and then bring them back six months later. And then do the typical endoscopic exam um, I, I, as an EUA, uh, digital rectal exam, endoscopic exam, and also a gastrograph and enema. But the, I typically do wait for reversing these patients at least six months, if not longer. Gotcha. Um, I want to be respectful of your time, but we still have about four or five questions to get through, if you don't mind. Not at all. Okay, great. Um, Dr. Bradley Krasnick wanted to know, what is your CRP protocol for your pouch patients? And if it's elevated, are you then reflexively getting a CT scan? And then kind of my tack onto that is, are you doing POPR and IV contrast with those CT scans? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I don't know if any of you saw the SLURP study that came out um, recently, it just got published in DCR this month by John Vogel. Um, that was an abandoned randomized trial. Um, of early omission of um, early ileostomy closure in pouches. So patients got like a three stage and then their, their ileostomy is being closed, you know, between 12 and 14 days after the pouch. And it was closed early because it, those patients who got closed early were having a higher septic complication. But what um, one of the, and I'm not sure how much this is mentioned in the manuscript, but one of the things that kind of came out of that study for me personally 
was a lower threshold to study these patients and um, radiographically. Um, I think you, with the caveat that it's been done at an expert center where you're not having some random, you know, first year radiology resident or tech jamming the mushroom, the um, Christmas tea, treat catheter into the into the anastomosis. I mean, it has to be careful. And I would say, be there yourself if 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 you want to study these patients. Um, what our our CRP protocol is an evolution right now. Uh, we started a quality improvement project uh, um, just about one year ago. Uh, checking it every day for seven days so that we get an internal calibration. Um, in another month or so, we'll have data on about 1,200 patients, and we're going to be looking to publish that in the next couple of years. But in most of the studies um, suggest checking it on day two and day four or day one and day three. And in general, most of the studies uh, use a cutoff of between 80 and 100 for, um, for infectious complications. Uh, I will say, you know, the more you use CRP, the more comfortable you get with it. Um, the really big cases, like with a big inflammatory burden, the CRP goes sky high. I mean, I've seen 300, 400 on a regular basis on day one and day two. Um, so I think more important than the level is the trend um, and, you know, how the patient's doing clinically. We don't use a CRP in isolation. We use it as another, you know, highly reliable data point. It's very, very sensitive, not specific, but it's very sensitive. If you have a patient who has a normal CRP and it's going up, that is something to be very, to take very seriously. Gotcha. So you're trending your CRPs post-op? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think, you, I think, you ha I would say that if you're not going to check it every day, which I'm not advocating for, we're doing it every day so that we can study it and calibrate which days we should check it on. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, one random CRP is useless by itself. I mean, it gives half the information, but by trending it at least twice, you, the trend is more is equally as important as the absolute number. Sure. Um, and then a couple more questions on the Zoom. Dr. Trey Modi wanted to know um, if there are any studies you're familiar with off the top of your head about comparison between Kono S and other um, hand sewn techniques, namely end to end anastomoses. Uh, I do not believe there's um, any um, direct comparisons. We we presently have a study. Uh, that is under review for um, ECHO 2023. Um, I'm not, I, actually, it's been accepted as a poster, um, but I don't know of any studies off the top of my head. No, there was a meta-analysis on Kona West that came out within the last month or two, um, but I don't remember if that included end-to-ends. And I, they mentioned Kona West for small bowel too, so I, don't, I, don't, I didn't read the article, to be honest. <laughs> Um, and then one more question about anastomoses. Um, you mentioned multiple studies. I'm not sure which one this is in reference to, but are you familiar with studies that compare end-to-end hand-sewn to end-to-side -end stapled? Um, you know, lots of attendings do end-to-side only for ileocolic because they're easier to scope and possibly dilate. Yeah, there there is a pretty robust uh, stapled end-to-side literature. We have a study that... Um, hasn't been published yet, but what, what we found internally was that basically there was no difference when comparing a stapled end to side to a stapled side to side. But as I mentioned that UPMC paper, the, the devil is probably in the details. So the traditional endpoints of perioperative septic complications, right? We all are doing our best anastomoses, right? That's not really the question. I think really the question is what impact does the anastomosis have on the quality of life and other healthcare resource utilization for the Crohn's disease patient? Are they having, you know, more um, IBS or SIBO? Are they having harder to intubate you know, terminal illness on endoscopy? Are they having more ER visits? These are the things that I think, you know, moving forward, we need to look at these other endpoints, not the traditional leak alone and, and necessarily post-op recurrence either. Um, and then in terms of pouches that you've salvaged with uh, the endosponge technique, kind of what are you seeing in terms of long-term functional outcomes? Or do you have that data yet? It's excellent. I mean, anecdotally, I don't have that data per se, but um, in my personal case series, the patients do great. I think the difference in the endosponge leaks is that you can only use it early in my opinion, in many's opinion. So if if it's if you're getting to them within the first couple of weeks after a leak and they're diverted, then the inflammatory burden is minimal, meaning the bacterial inflammatory burden. 
and that is going to soften up with time as opposed to a leak that's been there for three months already and the inflammation is really already like rock hard i think you know the the, the ones that are already kind of frankly infected you're going to have a harder time salvage and not just a leak but actually salvaging their pouch function sure um and then kind of uh one last question for me you know i've definitely had patients post up with um, you know, some pretty significant pouch stenosis. What size stapler do you tend to use or kind of any techniques that you um, try to be more cautious about to try to avoid that? I think, you know, the probably the, the best thing you can avoid to do to avoid a stricture is to avoid a long rectal cuff, right? So, um, you know, I think a mark in the twisted pouch syndrome case series, we found that Actually, a marker, so if you will, was that the patients were having long rectal cuffs also, and that might be a marker of a less experienced lower volume pouch surgeon that, you know, that is a key, a, a clue that they weren't getting high quality surgery. And, I, you know, I think there's a lot of work that we can do nationally to, to improve the quality of pouch surgery on a national level. Um, but so one thing is to avoid a long rectal cuff because then you're having ulcerative proctitis basically, and then that's going to stricture from the chronic inflammation. I personally use a 28 or a 29 because I think that that you know a lot of these patients are young and they they don't have a huge capacious anal canal, and I also um, like the way it sits in the small bowel. I mean, even though it's a pouch, you're anti-mesenteric and it's kind of you still have to think about the lumen of the of a single you know limb of small bowel when you're putting the the EA in. Um, so I think you know strictures are definitely um, a hard to deal with complication. Uh, we typically recommend using Hager dilations, and importantly, if you think it, if it's a um, inflammatory complication, then you have to think about getting these patients referred back to IBD gastroenterology to consider a biologic to try to minimize the inflammatory burden as much as possible. Occasionally we'll put um, Kenalog steroids into these strictures when we dilate them too, but I can't say uh, definitively um, whether that helps or not, but I don't think it hurts. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time, um, Dr. Halabar. This was a fantastic talk. We had a lot of engagement um, kind of on both ends and thanks for staying late to answer questions with us. It's my pleasure, everybody. Happy and healthy new year to everyone. Thanks for listening.